On this episode of The Career Musician, we have Jordan Siegel. Whether he's scoring projects for film and TV or performing and improvising before audiences on stage around the world, Jordan approaches every pursuit with the same mission in mind, to create music that truly moves people. And trust me, he does just that with credits like Ant-Man and the Wasp, Lego Movie 2, Trolls, Empire, Glee, The X Factor, The Morning Show, Deadwood the Movie, Penny Dreadful, Snoopy in Space, Peter Erskine, Jeff Hamilton, Graham Detcher, Common and of course Babyface, which is how we met while working with the National Symphony Orchestra's concerts at the Kennedy Center. Jordan understands the importance of keeping a versatile career while going from jazz, R&B to the big screen and everything in between. Check him out right here on the Career Musician Podcast. Jordan Siegel, composer, pianist, writer of music and all things above. Welcome to the Career Musician Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So, okay, much like uh, many of the people on the Tim Davies team, <laughs> we met doing the Babyface concert at the Kennedy Center with the National Symphony Orchestra. Actually, we met before that doing rehearsals. So, and, and, and I'm going to tell the story again, just like I told I love you, it. I love <laughs> Jeremy. <it. laughs> We we came into the first week of pre-production rehearsals or production rehearsals at Center Staging, and our keyboard player got sick. Remember that? I remember. Yes, I remember. And I was, and I was there. I was actually there just to help out with the orchestration and arranging side of things to to help with either like a digital performer problem or something unrelated to yes. piano in any way. I happened to be in the room. You happened to be in the room, and I'm like, wait a minute. You wrote the charts on these guys. You could sit down to the piano and knock some of them out, right? <laughs> it felt it felt like a movie moment. It was just like, hey, our keyboard is going. Can anybody do this? And like, you know, you look to everyone. You look to the janitor. You look to whatever. Like, yeah, I can do that. And uh, yeah, it was fun. It was it was great. That was awesome, man. Good stuff. Good times. Good memories, right? Yeah, it's great. Yeah. So, okay, how long have you been in LA? And originally, where are you from? I'm from LA. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I know you're, you're a rarity. I'm a rarity, yeah. So you're I'm like, from. Uh, you're like the yeah. yellow-bellied, speckled red jay. <laughs> I know. They're, we're out there, yeah. We're out there. Man, okay, cool. What part of LA did you grow up in? Uh, Westlake Village. Okay. You know that? Yeah. Yeah, and now you're in the valley. You, you know. I'm in the valley. Yes. Yep. All right. So you've been in the scene since day one, uh, and one of the questions I always like to ask to you know kind of get started here and break the ice with our listeners and our guests. Uh, how did the music bug bite you? Um, well, my dad uh, played piano just for fun, never professionally. And so from the time, you know, I was three, four, five years old, I would play piano with him and then uh, eventually started lessons. But it wasn't until high school when I was in the jazz band um, that I just fell in love with it and knew that I want to do something in music. I didn't know what that was. Um, I love jazz and I went to Berkeley College um, at first for jazz, but kind of decided, you know, this lifestyle of what I see the jazz musician lifestyle was not what I wanted. And so then, well, what could I do that still I would love? And and it became film scoring. And I, at first it was like, oh, like this looks fun. And then I caught that bug, which was like, oh, man, mm -hmm. making making music that really moves people when they're watching, you know, whatever it is, a Pixar film or a Spielberg film. like that music is making them cry. And that that's a very powerful, um, fun, fun thing to work on. It really is. I'll never forget one of my mentors many years ago uh, taught me, we were actually having some downtime. We were watching a movie, a scary movie. <laughs> I remember this so vividly. And he said, hey, do an experiment. Mute the sound for a minute. And, and I mute it. And I know this story, of course. Everybody says the same thing. But, you know, you mute the sound. And you're like, look, you're not scared, right? I'm like, wow, I'm really not. The suspense is gone. And then he's like, okay, now unmute it. And then all of a sudden you're scared again. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it's funny also being on the other side of it where you're composing for it. <laughs> and, you know, you watch a film and you're like, you're scoring this. Like, guys, I don't know if this is going to be scary. You're like, oh, okay. And then you put in your ominous drone pad and your few right. hits. But, uh, yeah, it's fun to watch it with the green screen and the special effects and, and the stuff where it's really not looking that scary, but you know, okay, this is in the end, it will be scary. As they say, we'll fix it in post, right? Exactly. <laughs> Have you ever had this happen where you're working late at night in the studio on a, on a, on a horror picture and you scare yourself while you're scoring it? Cause it's so eerie. 
it, it does get a little spooky. Yeah, it is right? like, I don't like to work on it late at night because right. I'm just like, I'm not going to sleep that well after just coming up with, yeah. I know, just, right? Lots of dissonant music, yeah. Yeah, and all those little weird sound design elements and stuff. Exactly. So, okay, so cool. So you went to Berkeley. So you went out, you went out east up to Boston. Yes. And then you came back. I did. And then when you got back here, did you just, you know, something that I like to kind of, uh, uh, you know, distill and break down for our listeners is how you made it happen, quote unquote. When I say it, meaning, you know, your career, the major steps in your career. So you go out there, you get your degree, you had some jazz performance, but also film scoring. You come back to LA, you say, okay, I'm here, hire me. Like, you know, talk about that. What was that? trajectory like what was that process it's tough and like yeah it's it's hard to to understand what that path will be for anybody because everybody's different for me um i was open to playing i was open to doing orchestration i was open to doing composing but there's nowhere just you go to like okay cool i'm ready to hire me there's no list there's no uh there actually i did i did get gigs if you can believe it through craigslist back in the day wow like back in 2010 i actually with a with a person that i still play with every once in a while it was actually a great a great recurring gig that happened through craigslist um different times yeah. but um yeah it it was random random things i played in rehearsal bands which is a weird thing in la where mm -hmm. you play music for free and you try and make connections and i did meet connections through that i met a bass player whose wife was a contractor and um that got me onto glee so I, I was doing on-camera piano work for Glee. Wow. And so that was a nice way to make some money and not feel pressure to get, you know, a, a job that out, outside of music, you know, something like that, that you can still work on your reel, you can still work on making connections and not have that pressure to, to earn, you know, a salary through some other non-music job. That's perfect. Um, let's, if you don't mind, let's park there for a second, um, because you're, you know, the umpteenth person who's mentioned uh, rehearsals here in LA. It's a, it's a very particular way to get connected, like you said. And I, I kind of want to break that down again for the listener. So out here with Local Forty Seven, the union, uh, you know, a lot of musicians and bands, they rent out the rehearsal rooms at the union. And they just rehearse. Oftentimes, uh, from my understanding, I've done a couple of them, but I haven't been immersed in that scene. Oftentimes, they're doing it for a particular uh, band that they have already in place, and you're subbing out. You're subbing for a person who couldn't make it. Or even times I know they just get together and jam for fun, right? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's everything. Yeah, there's people that are doing just individual jam sessions, but there are weekly big bands that rehearse. Right. Um, so I was part of some of them and then also subbing in others. And yeah, you, you meet players through that. And then I went to Jakarta for a jazz festival through that. Um, the so Java yeah, Jazz things. Fest. The Java Jazz Fest. Yes. It, I've, I've played that at least five times. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, it's a crazy one. <laughs> it is. It's fun. It's, a, it's, a, it's quite the trek. Yeah. It's quite the trek. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, I mean, stuff happened through that. I, I feel like I still feel like this to this day that it was a lot of planting seeds. It was a lot of like, okay, you meet this person, you meet this person and you never know which one's going to lead to anything, but you, you try and be a good person. You try to be nice. You try to be responsible. You try to, you know, hone your craft so that hopefully one of those seeds like, Hey, like we just got this thing that come up, came up, you know, what do you, what do you think about this? So um, there was that, there was stuff from college um, connections too. I uh, I was able to do the X Factor for for most of those it was like three or four years of that I think um, as a rehearsal pianist and that was just through a college a college buddy who was like hey they need a pianist for X Factor I'm like great um, so yeah. stuff like that just show up yeah. and play yeah exactly that's the other thing it's a it's very important to be able to just perform at you know at will right yeah and play um, anything that's asked of you. Yeah, to have a specific skill set, you know, within reason, I think there's a balance between being versatile and being able to do everything possible where you're not going to be really able to hone in on what you do well or what you're passionate about. But also there's a specific baseline of, I think, requirements that you want to call yourself a professional musician, you should be able to do A, B, and C. And so for me, um, and, that, and part of it is learning on the job, you know, for that show, I was basically, I would have to do a takedown of the song that we were working on 
some pop song that I maybe had heard or maybe hadn't, you know, while they're talking, maybe five, 10, five, 10 minutes, you have cool, learn this tune, get the arrangement down. And you just put on headphones while they're talking, like, cool, you got it. And you're like, yeah. And then you play it and maybe you got it. And then, okay, cool. We actually don't like that key, change a key. And so that skill of being able to learn a tune really fast and change keys just at will um, for, you know, relatively simple pop songs um, is, is just a really important skill. Man, and let's park there for a second. I'm so glad you said that. Yeah, you're hitting all the important points here. For those who don't know, a takedown means that you're going to listen to a song and you're going to write a chart, basically. Um, so I, I love the fact that you just described what it's like because the producer, the artist, and some executives are usually talking and chatting about while you're sitting there trying to figure out the song. And, yeah. and that is so true to real life. That's how it works, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so get really good at being able to transcribe on the spot, right? Yeah. Yeah. Really important. And I'm, I'm astonished how that has been such a big part of so many projects. Like I thought, oh, that's a college thing. Oh, it's tedious. You're doing it to learn. But no, there's so many projects every year. It's happening right now, either for me or for, for Tim Davies, who is our, our mutual friend um, and colleague. Um, where, yeah, there's a, Hey, there's a tune and they want arrangement. Well, you got to take it down first. Yeah. Um, or there's, Hey, we need a song that's really similar to this one. Well, it might be a good idea to, to take down, you know, enough so you know what's there and what to avoid and what you can possibly borrow from. Mm. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing how much sound alikes and takedowns are such a big part of the industry now. So true. Talk about your process there. Do you like to now in the digital domain, do you like to just have an iPad on hand with, you know, four score the app or do, or do you like to write it out, you know, on staff paper or whatnot? Or? Um, I, I like to do it straight into the notation program. We use, uh, I use Finale. Great. And, um, yeah, it's mostly, I mean, sometimes I just learn it first. If it's simple enough, mm -hmm. I'll just learn it um, on the piano and then later make a chart of it. If it's really simple, yeah, I'll just probably notate the chords on a, just a blank paper. Okay. But uh, if it's, yeah, if it's a, something more serious then yeah, just go straight into the notation program. So you're usually, uh, you know, running around town with your laptop in hand. If, yeah. If I have to. Yeah. I mean, for the X factor thing, that was just get it, get it in your head. Um, no, even not even time to chart it out. I mean, if it was charting out, it was just on a paper. Yeah. Not even into a yeah, notation program. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. Okay, so tell us what keeps you busy. Like, I know you're you know, a ranger, orchestrator. Uh, obviously, you have great transcription skills as well. Uh, you're a fantastic piano player. Uh, you know, what is it? Is it a, a combination of all these different things? Or do you find yourself, you know, focusing on one thing at a time lately? Yeah, I, fortunately, I'm, I'm able to kind of balance all the worlds. It's been really hard. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, between composing, I do a lot of composing. And, for and a composer, and, yes. Yeah, so, and, yeah. and uh, additional music for other composers. So it really depends on the month. And that's, it's great because I love doing all the three different things. I get a different fulfillment and satisfaction from each one. Mm -hmm. But it's also challenging in that you, you want to feel like you're excelling and, and you're honing your craft in all those fields. But there always might be people that say, oh, he's just a composer who's trying to be an orchestrator. Oh, he's just a pianist who's trying to be a composer. Like, what, you, you can get the pessimistic view. So it's really important, I think, to just to work on it. And, if, and again, I'm passionate about all those things. So I, I think it's still important for me to try and balance all of them. So, right. Yeah, it really just depends on the month. <laughs> yeah, and that, well said, well said. Uh, speaking of that, do you have any kind of you know, mantras that help you through it or scheduling uh, tactics that help you figure out, okay, you know what, as long as I do X, Y, Z every day, I'm going to be able to get through my day successfully or get through my week. Yeah. I, I think um, it's pretty, it's pretty basic time management skills for me is no notifications. Like that's, that's the most recent thing that I found is the most helpful. Just when it's time to do your work, whether that's compose or orchestrate and you know you need to get let's say three minutes of music done in a day for I, i'll go you know hour and a half no notifications don't bother me because otherwise especially composing i find it's really hard for me to to be productive if i'm like checking emails or somebody's texting you and um i find it's really helpful 
just to set those times. And then, yeah, set mini goals. You know, within this hour and a half, I want to compose a minute or whatever it is. Or within this hour and a half, I want to orchestrate this full cue. Um, so I, I think, you know, if it's either way, you know, if you're supposed to compose 15 minutes in a week, then you try and divide that up and and hopefully a little bit more, you know, say what is reasonable with that. Um, that's if right. you want to work seven days, then maybe you can do three days, three three minutes a day, and then you have a little buffer there. Right. Uh, if you get slower. But you should always account for, uh, you know, those unexpected moments, right? Exactly. <laughs> never never budget for what you think it's going to be. Budget, budget more, yeah. It's always going to take more than what you initially thought. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. Um, okay. So let's talk about the difference between this is such a, it's such an interesting subject because the, the overall view of composing, orchestrating and arranging can be oftentimes it's grouped into one, especially with players, right? Career musicians, man, I'm, I can play my instrument so good. I'm amazing at my instrument, but now I want to get into composing and arranging and orchestrating. But oftentimes it's all grouped into one little, you know, uh, 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 you know, bucket, if you will, but like you just said, it's not, there's different things and there can be negative stigma attached. If you're one thing trying to cross over into the other and you haven't really successfully, I guess, quote unquote, either paid your dues or in somebody's eyes, you know, earned it. Yeah. I think there's also a lot of gray area between those three things. I mean, especially in the film world where, you know, people have, composers work under them. And if none of them get credit as composers, then they're maybe arrangers, even though yes. maybe they compose the full music. So I think there's gray area there too. But in a traditional sense, I think of composer writes the music, um, orchestrator fleshes out their vision for a real orchestra, for or not even orchestra, real players, um, live musicians. And uh, arranging, I think, is a combination of the two probably. Usually you're orchestrating but in addition, you're creating new elements that the composer did not have there. But mm. there's still a big structure that the composer had. I kind of, I don't know if that's a dictionary. No, that's, 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 actually, that's actually a very clear breakdown of it. Thank you. I think the listeners will definitely gain some insight. Now, that being said, like you, you, you prefaced, that's a very, in a traditional sense. Nowadays, with all of the technology and the plugins and the sound libraries, it's so much of it is done by one person. Yeah. All, like you said, all three jobs, those gray areas. It's like, I, I know for myself, even if I'm composing a cue, I end up doing that and even mixing as I'm working. Yeah. Right. Have you found that? Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. If, if, if you're mixing it at the end, you're doing everything. It's yeah. put every, every job title. Yeah. Engineered by Nomad, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because if, if you're building it, as you're building it and creating it and fleshing it out, you want to hear it sound pleasing. You you don't want to have all the levels and volumes and panning and things be out of, you know, out of whack. Right. Exactly. So you're yeah. kind of tapering everything as you go. Yeah. I mean, you kind of have, have to have a decent knowledge of all the fields now just to be able to work, especially in the film music world. Um, I do not consider mixing one of my strengths, right. but you know, I can, I can do enough justice where, it sounds decent, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. So with some of your film work, you know, Ant-Man, the Lego movie, Trolls, and then your TV work like Empire. I mean, talk more about that and talk about working at the big studios on, on the big box, uh, you know, box office hits, so to speak. Yeah. So all those films that you mentioned were all, I, I was an orchestrator on them uh, with Tim Davies. Okay. And, um, it's, it's really just, you treat it like any other gig, um, especially, you know, I, I wasn't, uh, Tim was the lead orchestrator on those. So I didn't have to deal with any of the politics part of it. I just get to, to work on the craft of it, which is, it's a joy, you know, you get basically the processes, the composer sends you the music and then you, you know, you're going to get it recorded by how many ever people, 60 to 90 musicians. And you just want to make sure those sessions go as well as possible because any mistake or any confusion costs the studio lots and lots of money. And so, yeah, just you make sure that everything will sound beautiful. That's right. And I, I also, I iterate this a lot on the show 
I want listeners who don't work in the LA music scene or you know perhaps in a larger uh, you know scene like this to understand to really understand what it's like to be in one of those sessions. It's it's very stressful especially if you're not trained to be there. Right? Like if if you're in over your head, then it's going to be extremely stressful. But if you have been preparing for this and you you know and you really got all your ducks in a row and you've done your homework then it's not stressful it just becomes like you said it's the job it's what it is and, and the sessions are the best part i mean it's a joy right. to go there because the hard work is done you already made your decisions you know there were lots of decisions that go into every queue and and you live by those you know there's not many times you're like oh i hope this is gonna sound okay you know it's you're you, you know that you'll be able to deal with whatever comes up um, there's you, there's always changes. There's never a session where you just play everything through and it's you know no changes perfect. Let's go on to the next queue. There's always little changes, but within reason. Um, and it's just fun hearing it come to life. You know, um, especially yeah both both ways as a composer and orchestrator. I think it's different as a composer because you've been living with the music so much longer. Um, you maybe have been working on a movie for a year or six months or whatever it is. Orchestrators we usually come in towards the end. So we've been living with that music for two weeks or a month, and then we get to hear it. But composer, it's like, okay, I've been waiting a year for this. Let's hear what it sounds like. Right, right. Now, typically, once you're done orchestrating and you have all of your elements in place musically, you know, and sonically, all the different sections within the orchestra, you send all of that off to a copyist, correct? Usually, I, sometimes. Or do you? Like or sometimes we're everything, you know. Okay. If it's a smaller right. gig, then we'll copy it ourselves. You know, it's important to have those skills. But yes, for the bigger films where there's um, a big uh, deadline, where okay, we're gonna get all this music the night before, we gotta orchestrate it out, get it to the copy house, um, and they they have a team of people that can get it to the stands before 10 a.m. Um, whereas, yeah, it, it just takes a lot of people. I'm always grinning during this process because I love it so much. This is one of the things that really, you know, that I came out to LA for. So you can't see it, but I'm, I'm grinning ear to ear as I'm asking Jordan all these questions. And I just love hearing you talk about it and all the affirmations um, because this is the real life stuff that oftentimes you just don't learn in school, you know? Yeah. And people really need to hear exactly how it goes. So when, I love when you said you send it off to the copy house and they have teams that can get the stuff done before 10 a.m. the next morning. Uh, let's think about those teams and talk about the music nerdology that goes on there. I mean, <laughs> pretty intense, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. It's like you're talking about people who can literally just start s s transcribing stuff out of thin air without an instrument in sight. And I'm sure you're the same way. Yeah, I mean, you know, so much is digital now that a copy, a copyist is very different than they were 40 years ago when everything had to be literally notated by, by pen and paper, pencil and paper. Right. Now, um, you know, it's much easier with the notation programs, but it's still a lot of work. It still takes time to format stuff, make sure there's no mistakes, make sure everything looks good for the players. And I'm sure your finale templates are pretty uh, tidy, huh? Yeah, I mean, they've been going through lots of uh, changes for many, many years. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, do you have perfect pitch or relative? I have relative pitch. Oh. I do not have perfect pitch. The, I think those with perfect pitch, it's perhaps even a, a step easier. Would that, be, would that be fair to assume? Well, Tim and I were talking about this the other day, actually. Um, I'm not sure. I think relative, so um, relative pitch is you can, you can as, as long as you have a bass you know, note, you can tell everything relative to it. You can tell the harmony, right. you can tell the melody. Right. Um, I think, uh, you know, ideally, yes. If you have perfect pitch and relative pitch and you've honed that and you've worked on it, yeah, that's, I mean, that will make it easy, easy to do it easier than me. But I have found that, you know, if you don't work on the theory part of it as much, if you have perfect pitch, but you're not, you know, you don't know about how chord progressions work or recognizing, oh, that song sounds like this song. Or intervals, yeah. Then, then it won't be as easy, you know? Right. If, I, if I hear something and I've been working on it, it's like, oh, that sounds like here comes the sun. Boom, I know those chords. And the perfect pitch person is hearing, well, I hear E and G sharp and mm -hmm. a B, and then it goes to, I can hear these notes, F sharp. And you're like, well, no, you're taking too much time. Like yeah. it's it the sun, you know? Um, so right. I think, um, it, yeah, if you, if you work on it with perfect pitch, then you're, you're all set. But I, I feel like a lot of them might not think about the big picture as much. Um, Agreed. Like they take it for granted, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, relative pitch is something that can be learned and worked on. Yeah. Yeah. And perfect pitch is something that it happens more naturally, you know. Yeah, I think, but you have to learn it by the time you're six or something like that. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, so yeah, right, exactly. Well, yeah, I'm jealous of perfect pitch people. So. No, me too. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the process as an orchestrator, whether you're a lead orchestrator or, you know, second or third in, in the chain of command. Um, the relationship between the orchestrators and the composer. Uh, and I know it's different from composer to composer as to what you receive from them. But in a typical context today of, you know, again, a typical job with all of the digital assets and digital tools being util utilized to their fullest extent, what do you receive from the composer in order to start orchestrating? Typically, it's the MIDI file that they compose from and either a stereo audio file um, just their, their mix or mix and stems. And that's it. Okay. How in depth, how in depth is that MIDI file? Are they doing dynamic markings? Are they doing all the different, you know, tongings and fingerings for all the different yeah, sections? So I mean, the MIDI file just, I mean, it has controller data. So you can right. usually see, I mean, it depends on the composer too. Some, some composers, they're just, they're not putting any, you know, uh, volume data or anything like that it just it just looks flat and it sounds flat and so that that's actually much harder because then you're like well do they really want it flat or do they want me to add some shape to it and and sometimes you don't know sometimes they like it They're like nope we want it all really flat the director likes this they don't want shape that makes it too emotional and then sometimes they're like no please add the shape i'm just going fast and so it's important to talk with them and realize that um but yeah typically it's just the the midi data and um Sometimes it's very fleshed out where they they put it in different sections, meaning they separated violin one, violin two, viola, as they want it. I'd say that's a lot more rare. Um, usually it's it's like here's strings. Yeah. And then maybe they'll have a note, add woodwinds, or maybe and so that's that's when you your your craft really comes into play more um, in terms of okay, how can we divide this out? What should we add to make sure? it's really the gestures that they're, they want. Um, Cause it might sound good in the sequencer, but it's our job as orchestrators to make sure that it's going to translate to the real world. Well, it's like to the page and to the real players. Right. Yeah. All right. How often do the conversations, uh, you know, transpire between you and the composers, or is it more of like, Hey, Here's an email explaining what I did. I don't have time to talk to you cause I'm writing on the, I'm writing the next set of cues just go to, to go to town, you know? Yeah, it really depends on the composer. I think mostly it's go to town. Yeah. And then if there's anything you should know, they'll put it in a comment, you know, either in a text box or whatever right. it is for you to, to look at. Um, I have had other relationships where it is like, hey, call me, I want to talk about this. Like, let me know what you did. And like, cool that, you know, it's a little more collaborative. And, and sometimes it does border on more arranging. They're like, okay, I did a piano track, turn it into a lot more than that. Um, and they'll send video and stuff like that. And it's orchestrating, but, but a little more arranging. Also arranging. Yeah. And is there, is there a way to separate that, uh, in the, within the union rates? Do you guys get paid as an arranger and orchestrator separately or how does that work? It, it's all orchestrator. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and that rarely happens on a union gig. I, I think those are less for the, the, on the big, big gigs, um, especially like not video games it's it's been fully fleshed out because the the directors and producers really want to hear it you know right. right yeah right is there anything within that process that you've had an aha moment where you're like oh my gosh i can't believe it now it all makes sense again coming from school and then coming back into the la scene and doing it for real were there moments where you're just like oh yeah now it's clicking i i think there's aha moments in different ways. I think from a business standpoint, there's the aha moments of like, oh, wow, I never realized that connection would lead to a gig like this. Mm -hmm. um, where, oh my God, like really this, this guy that, you know, I drank, you know, beer with in college, like he just gave me this big gig or whatever, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. Um, and then there's, um, I, and then there's just aha moments of learning your craft of, of orchestration. There's, that's constant. Um, especially when I was starting out, you know, um, all the stuff that they teach you in college, it, it doesn't necessarily 
translate to what is now the the default, what is now the norm in terms of um, studio orchestras. Right. So, but what um, they, you know, or or just trying something that, oh man, this sounds so good in the sequencer, and then you try it in the real life, you're like, whoa, that, that didn't sound as good, or, um, you know, learning that brass players can't make leaps like pianists, you know, mm-hmm. um, and that, which is just all about learning your craft. So true, so true. Um, speaking of that, do you, which which set of, of you know, uh, software do you prefer? Which DAW, which uh, plugins, you know, libraries, things like that, or is it just kind of all over the map? It's kind of all over the map. I'm, uh, I use Digital Performer and uh, Pro Tools um, for, for my DAWs, and I record mainly into Pro Tools when I'm recording piano. Right. Um, and then samples is everything. Um, every, everything everyone has, yeah, Spitfire, and uh cinematic studio series and uh uh let's see lots of i have like all the pianos you know all the The atmosphere and keyscape and all those things yeah so i like sony score have you used them the orchestra uh i don't think so oh it's pretty cool they're called sony score and they have these really cool orchestra uh plugins where or instruments where they give you the different sections but then they also give you the whole orchestra, which, you oh. know, East, East, West has, all of them have that, you yeah. know, but, but for somebody like me who cheats when it comes to yeah. orchestrating, <laughs> it comes yeah. in handy, you know? That's so, great. Yeah. It makes sense for you not to use it because that's what you do. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, man. I love that. Okay. So I, I wanted to get all that out of the way because it's so important. And I feel like, you know, our listeners really benefit from hearing firsthand experience. Once again, somebody like yourself, Jordan, you know, uh, you know, everybody listening, he's been on the front lines for many years now in the big studios, in the big sessions, talking about, like you said, the politics of it, the crazy deadlines, getting things done, you know, so thank you for sharing that because it definitely, you know, helps shed light. Now I want to talk about the other side because apparently uh, downbeat has just, you know, like did a feature on you and you're just crushing it on the jazz side with your own compositions and album and talk about that, man. Tell us. Yeah. So I, uh, thanks for asking. I, um, I released my debut album last year. It's called beyond images. And, um, the goal was just to have, um, a bunch of compositions and music that felt like my, like a true artistic statement. I felt like, you know, when you're, when you're doing film scoring or orchestrating, it's, there's, there's always something else that's dictating what you can write, um, whether it's the video or whether it's the composer. Um, and so I wanted to have a, a project that was like, okay, this is this is where my sensibilities lie. And basically it's just a calling card. Um, basically anybody can check me out. Like, oh, who's this Jordan Siegel guy? They can go to Spotify and they can listen to uh, to the music that I like to write to, and they can kind of hear everything in there. I hope, I hope that's the goal again. Um, but they can hear me play piano, they can hear the orchestrational side of me, and then they're all original compositions. And the, um, uh, in addition, the concept was that every song was dedicated to a great film composer. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of combining all the worlds. It's not just, okay, here's my piano album. It's like, okay, well, I I do feel like this is all part of what makes me uh, an artist. So um, there's a song from Bernard Herrmann, there's a song for John Williams, there's a song for Thomas Newman, Randy Newman, basically all my favorite film composers and they're they're meant to uh be an ode to them but not necessarily emulate them just kind of filtered through a jazz voice right i love that and i love the play on words beyond images being that you work in the in the film and tv scoring you know that's yeah, you great got it. <laughs> yeah, now now talk about the the experience with downbeat because downbeat is one of the most prestigious jazz publications there are period i mean it's it's the one, man. They've been around for, you know, they, they they have stood the test of time. And all of the legendary cats that we look up to as, you know, fans of jazz, Downbeat, you know, usually brings them to light. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, they, um, uh, a month after I released the album, it was selected as one of their editor picks of the month. And so they wrote a nice little article about it. And uh, yeah, I was honored, honored to be there. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think that's very cool. I like, you know, you. for me, it's, it's just as impressive to have that as it is to have your, you know, extensive resume in the other side of the industry. Uh, talk about 
splitting up your life? Because it's so funny because I I asked Jeremy this. I talked to many other people, of course, Tim, just a lot of people on the podcast. Because I'm of the same you know mindset where, yes, we do a lot of this work to earn money to for our career, but then we have to have a portion of it that we save for ourselves. You know, I I think if we, and I hate to say it like this, but there was a while I spent some time on the road. And I felt like I was giving away my talent to all the people I was working for. But when I came home, I had no, nothing left for myself, you know? Yeah. And, and I think it's so important that people are starting to realize, no, you know what? I have to do my passion project. Yeah. How yeah, do, I, how I do think, you arrive at that? Yeah. I mean, work-life balance is, is really important. I'm... I'm a big fan of enjoying your life, as stupid as that sounds. I, I see it so much in our industry of just people working 20 hours a day and, you know, no weekends. And then you just see them like, why are you doing that? What's, I mean, I know some people think that's the only option. Like, well, I want to be a big composer. So I have to internship and do an internship and work 20 hours a week. But I, I'm a big fan of, um, if you want to write something meaningful and do something meaningful with your music, then you've got to have some joy in your life. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I like to, you know, eat good food and in LA, we're very lucky. We have good food everywhere. Um, and just, uh, I mean, I love movies too. So I love watching movies and TV shows and, and just taking a break from and not everything needs to be music 24 seven. I, I think it's, it's a healthier lifestyle. I agree with that. I agree with that. What are some of your favorite pastimes? Um, I like playing ping pong. <laughs> Oh, cool! I my house. Um, I love my my dog, so I like taking him for little walks, and uh, and and I travel. I, I at least I, I used to when we could travel easier. Right. Um, yeah. The, the the year before, uh, let's see, twenty nineteen, I went to Vietnam and Japan, and um, I think I went to Tulum, and yeah, it was, it was great. Wow. Now, were you doing that just for fun, just for holiday? Just for yeah, just for fun. Were you flying solo? Uh, no, with my wife. Okay, cool. Yeah, that together. must have been awesome. Very yeah. cool. All right, so all of this being said, and I like to ask everybody this because it varies. How do you define success? I think, I think if you enjoy what you do and you're able to live comfortably, and you don't have to worry too much. You know, there's always going to be stress. There's always going to be worry, but within reason. I think if you if you love what you do and you're, yeah, living comfortably, financially, um, that doesn't mean you're you're rich, but you can survive and not not worry about putting food on the table and feel not feel that stress as much. Um, I, to me, that's success. Yeah, mainly loving what you do, and yeah, I I, I think um, then there's there's different. Um, grades of it maybe, but yeah, yeah, for me. No, it's great. I, I, I dig that totally. And what would you tell somebody, let's say uh, some younger musicians out there who want to come to LA to quote unquote, make it, <laughs> whether that be as a player or, uh, you know, as in the film and TV industry, what are you going to tell them? I think it's, you know, all the things I was talking about earlier, be responsible, be professional, um, and, and know what you're passionate about, um, know what you can, what service you can genuinely provide for somebody else. How can you help someone rather than what can you take from someone? Mm. So if you want to, if you want to work in whatever field, whether you're a musician or a composer, like, Hey, I'm really passionate about this type of music. Um, I'm good at it. You know, um, how can I help you genuinely, not, not, uh, insincerely. And I, I think it might take some time, but but if you're talented and you're nice, then you'll be successful. I mean, there's very, I, I can't think of really anybody that I know that's like, man, that guy's so successful. He's so nice and he doesn't have any work. You know, I was like, no, if you're really, if you're really good at what you do and you're really nice, then you're going to be okay. That's true, man. Very true. Well said, my friend. Okay. Speaking of uh, good food, what are some of your favorite restaurants here in LA? Oh, good food. Um, I love salsa and beer, which is a, a, a Mexican restaurant near me. Um, yeah. Let's see. I love good sushi, but I don't know. I don't have a current spot right now. 
There's so many places for a good sushi. I, know, I mean, I love good Thai food. I don't know. It's hard okay. to. It's you have a broad palate. Yes. I mean, I love everything. Like, yeah. Vietnamese food. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I, that's I don't awesome, know. man. Just just like your musical taste. It's, I love it. I mean, that's, that's musicians. That's how we are, you know? Exactly. You know, and don't tempt us with with a with a good meal because we're always going to say yes. So, yeah. <laughs> In fact, we'll play for free oftentimes if there's a good meal, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I used to do a gig at a sushi restaurant. They used to feed us in sushi, and uh, and they they would pay us, but it was mainly for the sushi that I did the gig for so long. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Cool. Where can everybody find you online? Uh, you can find me on Instagram. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. You can check out my Spotify. Um, you can check out, uh, if you want to hear me, you can check out the peanuts, uh, all the peanuts, Apple TV shows. I, I play all the piano for those. Dude. Okay. I am sorry. I didn't even mean to gloss over that. You got to talk about that. Thank you. So, yeah, so, uh, that's been, I mean, maybe the most fun gig I've had over the past few years. Um, it, I do it, uh, maybe once or twice a month. It's been happening for probably two or three years now of, yeah, I get to play piano for all the, the new Snoopy shows and, there's all these Apple TV peanuts projects. And so Jeff Morrow's the composer. He's great. He's awesome to work with. And uh, luckily he likes my piano playing. So I get to keep doing it. And so we just, we did a documentary a few months ago that just came out. Uh, I think it's called, what's it called? Um, Who are you, Charlie Brown? It's about the I maker. Just, of peanuts. I just saw the trailer last night. Oh yeah. Oh, so you heard, so then you heard me playing. You did that. That's awesome. That was, yeah, that was me. Um, and so on that one, so for the Snoopy show, which is is the main Apple TV show, it's all original music. It's all Jeff's music. And I, but there's a lot of improvising. It's a lot of fun. But for this documentary, um, we got to re-record the the Vince Guaraldi pieces. Mm. So uh, we re-recorded uh, Linus and Lucy, the famous one, the main theme, and also skating, which was which was awesome. I mean, it's great. It's like as a jazz piano movie tv guy that's like the dream you know so it is the dream uh, and and to feel those footsteps of vince garaldi man come on yeah so that that wow. that's been a lot of fun that's awesome so when you're when you're tracking with jeff morrow for that does he you have you have like a, a score to follow a chart and then does he have open solo sections just like on any other jazz uh, arrangement yeah, it's uh, it's actually been an interesting process. So now that we've been working together for for three years, the the workflow has changed a little bit um, depending on the project too. So at first, yeah, I mean it would be here's the you know there's a, a lot of that's just written out, um, but within re, you know sometimes there'll be chord symbols. So he's like, hey, if you want to revoice anything, you can do that. And then other times there'll just be you know chord symbols for two minutes or a minute or twenty seconds here. It's like, hey. Um, you know, play something. And then usually I'll ask, well, what's going on? And then the picture will be there. And I'll say, oh, Woodstock is flying around with little birdie friends and play something happy and cool. And so, cool. So you get to kind of put on the film composer and piano thing, you know, um, and we can speak, a, and he's a jazzer as well. So we can speak a similar language of, hey, like this is more of a Oscar Peterson vibe or, hey, this is more of a Thelonious Monk vibe. And I'll know exactly like, okay, that's more like this versus that. Yeah. Absolutely, um, man, you, and bro, you have to have some serious chops to fill those, uh, to fill those references, man. I, I, I work on it. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's hard. You do but... you do, man? You do. You crush it. Thank you. Absolutely, that's so cool. All right, well, yeah. So that's where everybody can hear you right now. Like you said, they can also hear your album Beyond Images, and that's Siegel S E I G E L Jordan Siegel dot uh, com. And then, of course, the IG is just Jordan Siegel Music and then YouTube, same and so forth. So, yeah, look them up, man. You're not going to be sorry that you checked Jordan's music out. You are a beast. You're crushing it, bro. Thank you. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, one of the things here with The Career Musician, our our whole mission is to, you know, not only inspire musicians that want to pursue their dreams, but help them to figure out how to create a sustainable career, right? You know, here's the, here are the goods, here's the, the keys to the, to success so far for creating a sustainable career. And like you said, sometimes it just takes a little bit of everything, but find your passions. I really like that. So, you know, if you have three passions, hone in, stick to it, be a nice person and uh, voila.
Exactly. There you have it, everybody. Jordan Siegel. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, brother.